Good evening. Welcome to the first screening of the 2014 Understanding Taiwan through film and the documentary series. I'm Zhang Biyu. Hello. It's very good to see so many new faces today. It's fantastic. Uh, tonight's film is 62 years and six and a half thousand miles between. And we are delighted to have the film's director, Anita Chan, Zhang here uh, with us tonight. Let's give her a round of applause. Thank you. Uh, Anita is an independent filmmaker, teacher, and a writer. She has involved in many arts projects and also has taught in many places in the world, including the US, Taiwan, and Nepal. I hope I got it right. Yes. And uh, in, the film is a quite intimate uh, uh, documentary exploring the screening, uh, sorry, the seemingly vast cultural and the geographical uh, distance between the filmmaker herself, who was uh, growing up in uh, the US, and her 100-year-old grandmother, who was born in the Japanese period and uh, uh, witnessed the turbulent uh, retrocession uh, of the KMT regime, and also lived to see the democratization of Taiwan. So what a life, uh, uh, such a brilliant life that she's celebrating. Um, according to the issues raised uh, in Anita's own website about this particular film, she questions how the post-colonial history is constructed and also explores the blurred boundaries between history and memory. And if we say uh, truth, is, is there any such thing as real truth? Or memory, when we look back, is it sometimes a little bit shifting or maybe sometimes being reconstructed. So in, this, in addition, through the exploration of Amas, uh, a life story, uh, we can also see how Anita herself tries to navigate her own path and reposition her 21st century uh, Taiwanese American identity. So after the screening, we will have the opportunity to ask her more questions, okay? As before, we always say this, and um, at the end of introduction of the filmmaker, we will, uh, on behalf of the uh, Center of Taiwan Studies, we would like to thank the Ministry of Education, uh, sorry, Ministry of Culture, <laughs> and the generous donation of Dr. Uh, Ying. And um, because of their uh, support, that's why we can afford to put on this series. And thank you very much for, um, for the representative, uh, someone from the uh, Ministry of Culture. Um, now, without further ado, we'll have a film. Uh, but, sorry, before we start the film, sorry. <laughs> Anita would like to say something, and I'll hand it to her. I'm sorry. Okay. Yes, please. such a warm and lovely introduction. Thank you. Um, yeah, I just uh, wanted to thank everyone for being here today. Um, it's been quite a while since I've actually seen the movie, so um, it'll be good to see it again, I guess. Um, what you're going to be seeing tonight is actually a director's cut, which I've never made. I mean, I've always thought all my films are director's cuts, but um, for, for this particular work, it was very complicated to make. And um, there were a lot of different interests that I had to balance. There was compromises made, um, scenes taken out, uh, you know. So it, it's kind of good that you'd be able to see what um, I originally wanted to have um, made. And it's also, I have so many different versions of this work um, in different, um, you know, the voice, uh, a dub over version in English of the Chinese version. And then me speaking Mandarin for the voiceover with Chinese subtitles, and then the public television version, which is shorter, with scenes cut out. And then you have the right. It was like it was pretty crazy. And since I shot it on film, 16 millimeter, um, you know, subtitling was tricky. I had to send it to France to burn the laser the title in. So um, and it's pretty much at this point, it's the last film, actual celluloid film I made. 
2008, and since then I've been working in digital video. And I'm not sure if I'll shoot on film again, but um, it, they're very different processes. So just to let you know, anyway, that, that's all I wanted to say. <laughs> but, Do you prefer the DVD version or your own version? We do have one in the library, so everyone can borrow oh. again. So which you prefer? The well, the one that I had sent Set. you. That that's the director's. Yeah. You would like this one. Yeah. yeah. Show me. Um, one of the things you mentioned was that there were different versions of, of this film, and, and one version was the the public television service. Uh, one and there was some kind of you suggested there were some kind of struggles. I was wondering if you could um, say a little bit about about that and uh, how, for example, this version was different from the the public television uh, version. Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> you know, I I, I worked uh, independently um, prior to, to Taiwan public television, and um, you know I was kind of I was young and sort of stubborn and. You know, like, oh, artistic integrity and no censorship and freedom and all that typical American values, you know. And, um, and then when I started working with Feng Shanshan, who um, uh, is really this uh, Ni Chang-wen, amazing woman. I mean, just smart and so committed and just dedicated. And, and she had uh, discussions, um, these long discussions uh, with filmmakers about their works. And some filmmakers in Taiwan decided not to work with her because she had certain, um, you know, really set ideas, and and of course she defends her ideas really well. I mean, you get to listen to her, and you know, um, and she wanted me to, yeah, take out a few scenes that she thought would, um, you know, aggravate um, the tensions that are already existing in Taiwanese society. Um, the scene where um, my aunt says that uh, many people use Taiwan as a springboard; um, they take everything and leave. And there's no feeling or caring about the land, and um, and I think, you know, Feng Shenzhen said I agree with that, but we don't want to exasperate tensions with, um, you know, Taiwan as a multicultural society, you know, with, um, you know, the 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 Kuomintang or the, the the population that came, you know, from China and um, or second generation, and, and so she and I, and I was like, okay, I, you know, I can respect that, you know. At first, though, I thought. Well, that's sort of censoring my aunt because that's my aunt's, you know, narrative. And then, but then I understand. I understood her concerns because I think the stakes were really high when you're working with uh, public television, and and uh, you know, you know, you always kind of want to go to the safer route. Um, so yeah, so I think that was a kind of a big deal for for me. And at first, I thought I would just give up the funding and you know, <laughs> perhaps keep just making the movie and. Um, my friends who had helped me out up to this point, um, which had been already several years, they said, look, you know, you've worked so hard and this is just one scene to take out. What do you think? You know, we think you should just keep going at it. And so, um, so I just, I deferred to her judgment. And I thought, you know, of course I should do that because, um, you know, in terms of ethics, I mean, I feel like, you know, move, especially for documentary filmmakers, that when you make a movie, you need to think about who is most materially affected by the work, you know, and the people living in Taiwan, they're the ones that, uh, you know, have the biggest stakes, right? And, um, you know, I mean, recently I lived there for six years, but there's, there's, there's something about uh, being tied to the land and not being able to leave, if, even if you want to leave, right? So those are the kind of things, compromises that I made, and also just part of growing up, you know, <laughs> kind of as an artist, and like, all right, you know, this is, there's some advantages in, to, to working with public television, and there's some, you know, compromises that I'm willing to make, so. Any questions? Right, I have a question. Um, it's quite interesting because in your own website, and also you mentioned about it, um, in the film actually, you talk about, uh, you're not really sure about this uh, um, life story. It was written by, by your auntie rather yeah. than by your grandma. So it's the second-hand information and also was written sort of based on her memory about her childhood. Mm -hmm. So it's not about grandma anymore. It's about the older generations uh, re you know, recalling what's going on in the past. So what's your take on this? How are you going to cope with this? How you, uh, you know? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, I was, I was very struck by 
you know, I mean, the, the thing with, in U.S., you know, it's all, especially with scholarship, it's always about integrity, integrity, you know, cite the, you know, who is the source, and, you know, being very authentic. Yeah, yeah, yeah and that's, that's a very American kind of part of me, and then when I found out that, wait, but it says Chen Ong Sisha, my grandmother's mm -hmm. name, you know, as the author, and actually she didn't write it, I, I, I mean, I was really shocked by that, mm -hmm. it didn't, so I mentioned that in the, in the movie, and, um, but you know, I mean, my grandmother read it, and she wanted the award money, and whether or not she... <laughs> How much was it? I don't even know. <laughs> I mean, not even that much. <laughs> but I mean, in terms of, it's just like she can gamble, you know. She likes gambling. But, um, but you know, it's this, this thing about, um, you know, I mean, I don't know how much was negotiated in terms of this isn't true. Or this is, I mean, I think generally it was probably accurate for enough for her to say, okay. Mm. Um, and also because it was published and it was the public, you know, so I think, um, you know, you, I think all of us, I think as scholars, we always kind of just like, okay, credibility, you know, mm -hmm. peer review, or <laughs> like, generally, all right, I think this, this is okay, you know, like, um, but I, I just felt like still that there was, um, it, it just, it sort of spoke to the precariousness too, the way we cobbled together information to, bring about a certain mm. narrative of history, right? We're, we're doing that all the time. It's quite interesting so. because when I read the uh, script first on, on the website, it feels like more about you rather than about grandma. Don't you feel that? It's like growing up, it's, it's about how you na navigate uh, being a Taiwanese or a Taiwanese American, or what do you think? Yeah, um, yeah I, I hope that people see it that way. I mean, I try to, you know, be fairly reflexive in, in the documentary itself because also the documentary is a construction mm. as an art form, yep. you know, um, and you're putting together information and the fact that my mom does two take of the same, you know, kind of, you know, <laughs> I mean, I kind of thought that that was, you know, really, uh, you know, uh, interesting and to put in there. Um, but I hope that people too get a sense at least of what kind of a person my grandmother was. Mm. You know, mm. if anything, you know, the kind of berating <laughs> of me and the berating my, you know, aunt, she's a very strong-headed woman. I mean, you can kind of make those mm. sort of um, conclusions, you know, and, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Anyone? Just yes, please. Simple question. When did you complete this, the, 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 this film? And uh, were you born in Taiwan or, or were you born in the, in the States? I was born in the States. Yeah, and I completed in about 2000. So about eight years ago. Yeah, yeah. I know, I haven't seen the movie in a while. Why the question? Because I agree with your, with your analysis that it is also about you. <laughs> because you, you think, why would you make a film like this? What's your motive? What's your inspiration? And I get the sense that it is you who... Making sense. Making sense of yourself as somebody whose roots are in time ancestry in Taiwan and yet has very little connection other than by blood but you have little because you were born in the States perhaps that you somehow are trying to discover your own roots mm -hmm. through Amma mm -hmm. um, and this I think applies increasingly as more people immigrate and they have their children in, the, in, in foreign countries mm -hmm. and the children grow up hearing the language of their parents, but mm. unable to communicate with their grandparents mm. through their own mother tongue. This is increasingly mm. you know, common, especially in Taiwan, when the mother tongue language was forbidden to be spoken. Now, Amma lives through several e eras of yeah. colonial rule, through the Chinese, the Qing dynasty, through, yeah. through to Japanese colonial rule, then the Republic Chinese rule, so I think the Amar has gone through all the different periods, mm. of the most recent periods of colonial rules. I don't know whether you have seen the film uh, Lang Tao Sa. Mm. It is one, it, 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 it's again, charts the history of Taiwan. Is it a feature now? But it's, um, it was made into a, uh, I, can't, I don't know how to explain it. Again, Dian Shi Jiu. Oh, <laughs> and it, it, the era is very similar. And um, so, so I think it's, um, that's why 
I was thinking of the last way I asked a question whether you were born in Taiwan, whether you you were born yeah. out of New York. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? <laughs> um, one of the things you mentioned was that um, your grandmother actually read the um, uh, the actual text of, mm -hmm. of the book, mm -hmm. and uh, I've got okay. She likes the uh, the the prize money, but did, she must have had some comments. She must have. There must be something she dis disagreed with. Did, were you ever able to get to to uh, to that point? Well, that, that's interesting. You mentioned that because you know um, when I was prepared to to work on her film, and I and I got the funding to be able to travel to Taiwan. Um, you know, as an artist, for me, you know, I, I can travel when I can get some support, right? So I always, I love artist residencies because they pay you to go. And so Taipei Artist Village, you know, I was like waiting for the money to come through and it came through. But when it did, that was when my grandmother had her stroke, her third stroke, which um, uh, she could not speak at all. And so, and she was also easily tired. So I can only ask her about one question, maybe every other day. And the one thing I knew when, I, I actually had the whole book translated for me, okay? So uh, a lot of the things I, I knew about already, about her life, uh, but then there was one part which I definitely, well, it was wrong, which was that she fell in love with, you know, that she chose to marry my grandfather. And I knew that that was wrong because she had told me in Taiwanese when I was uh, younger, I had interviewed her, um, that she, um, uh, didn't didn't like to get married, and she didn't like having children. Um, but she had one after the other, after the other, after the other. She said it was horrible. And I thought, am I understanding her Taiwanese correctly? Because I thought they were so in love with each other. And so I thought, you know what? If I'm going to make a documentary about my grandmother, at least one thing needs to. I need to give her one thing, which is the thing is, which is, she was forced into marrying my grandfather. And all her children are, you know, are in denial of it, including my mother. So that's why, I, if you notice, it's very diplomatic. And I go through my translator to ask this question rather than me asking it, which was Grandma told Anita that she actually had a boyfriend. She was already in love before, you know, she had married grandfather, you know. And so we, we I confronted my aunt with this, and of course my aunt just repeated the narrative of the book, right? Which is, he fell into the, he saw this quiet woman, but she was actually just motion sickness, you know, experiencing motion sickness, but thought she was so gentle and wanted to marry her. Little did he know, you know. <laughs> but, um, and, and so like, you know, that then it went into that realm. But, so this is what was so tricky about making this movie is that I wanted everyone to be pleased with it. And of course, that's really hard in a movie, especially in a family-themed um, movie. And so I had to, it was a really delicate balance, you know. And um, yeah, I wanted that at least to be there for her. <laughs> so it's a good question. <laughs> yeah. Any questions? Yes, please. Um, and, right? and so I went to visit her and she, she you know, at the end, she was very quiet, you know, but then we, she, you know, sent me off in a taxi. It was in, um, in Holi. Right, and um, she sent me on time, but before she and I was gonna close the door, and she held the door open. I was like, oh, what's going on? And she goes, we are haka, don't ever forget. And I was like, what's haka, you know? And she looked at me with a serious face, you know, don't ever forget this. And she goes, okay, you know, close the door. So then I asked my, parent, my mother, you know, what haka is. I was like, what's haka, I can't forget this. And I was like, oh, it's nothing. I'm like, what do you mean? The like, is Hakka, isn't he? What is that? You know? And she said, oh, the, it's Cantonese. It's you know, from Canton. <laughs> so then, you know, a lot of my Chinese American friends or Asian American friends are from or Cantonese or Toisan. They speak Toisan, so I'm like telling all my Cantonese friends, hey, I'm part Cantonese, you know? <laughs> and they're like, what? How are you trying? And then so yeah, and so then I thought like I was Cantonese for a while, you know? And then I was just like. And then my, and I told my dad, he's like, yeah, you know, Hakka. And, but he was very quiet. Like, he never, um, you know, I think it was part of the history of discrimination, and he just kind of denied that part of him. And, you know, and so he you, didn't learn the language. Yeah. Do you mean that your father's side is Hakka? Yeah, and my, your mom's side is a local Minan? Well, it gets really crazy because, okay, so my dad is, my dad's father is Hakka. Oh, and then, what? Yeah, and then his mom is, uh, well, you know, well, we Taiwanese, right? Mm -hmm. And then and then my mom, you know, like the past 
I think maybe past five or seven years, she went to a lecture and she's like, oh my God, we're ping poo. And I was like, really? <laughs> what? She was like, totally makes sense because we're matrilineal. My mom, he's, her side was very like pro-woman and never, I didn't, I didn't have any like patriarchal whatever. You know, and also, you know, because it's Ping Dong and it's, yeah. you know, Tainan and, you know, Feng Shan, that area. So she's like, oh my God, we were, you know, we're Ping Pu. So, I mean, I really don't know, but I mean, one thing, like at the end, I mean, I kind of felt like, well, the one thing I, I definitely have in common, I can make a conclusion, is that, um, you know, that my connection to Taiwanese, to people on tai in Taiwan, you know, is that we've been led astray, you know. And I think being led astray, that, that's the whole thing. It's like you're told you're this, you're told that you should only speak this, you're told that you should, you know, only obey this, these rules, you know, whatever. And so, you know, those are the kind of things that, uh, you know, when you're aware of that, then you can decide your own path, like, or at least have a, you know, a possibility to think about what, what is it that you want to be, you know, what makes sense, you know, what is, yeah. <laughs> because I think that's what's interesting about the so-called new world, because it's not just America or Australia, yeah. it's places yeah. because everybody has ancestors from wherever. So, yeah. And in America, you have all sorts of descendants of like other nationalities. Sure. And you generalize to the same. I mean, this new nation is America, and then yeah. the Americans with such right um, background, and then each of us in search their past, and through your parents understand it, and you understand another way. And I think that's. Um, I spoke to some of my foreign friends and they said that's the funny thing about Taiwanese people because we always say we're Chinese and then suddenly people from China say, well, but you're not Chinese and then some other people say, well, you're Chinese and so then it gets yeah, back confusing and, um, and I was wondering maybe you might also yeah. as part of your search um, because when I came to this country I always just said I was Chinese because that's what I was told to say um, and until somebody yeah. said, no, you're not yeah, exactly. And we used to eat, my mom used to make Japanese food, and I always thought Japanese food was Taiwanese food, you know? And I, when I was speaking, to, and I grew up, so actually my first language is Taiwanese, and, um, you know, I would swear at the kids in Taiwanese, and I thought everyone wow. spoke Taiwanese. Yeah, they would take my cookie, and I'd get pissed, you know, I'd get upset. <laughs> you know, my mom told me this little whole story. She was cracking up, and the kid was like, oh. Oh, "But I thought, you know, I mean, you're you're young. You don't really know, right? And then you then you realize, oh, this influence of you know, Japan, and you know, so so I think like the history is really important to know, and yet we know the history is also very slippery, slippery, exactly, <laughs> and so. And so, you know, this idea of oral history too is, is really important, you know, to, to ask the, those questions, the hard questions, to, and to ask people to, to try to remember it and try to be brave to say it, mm -hmm. to speak out about that, yeah. Any questions? Or comments? Or comments, <laughs> please. <laughs> Uh, I mean, we heard from your grandmother in the film, and um, I just wanted to ask, how do you feel, say, self-determination of a people um, sort of values again, say, like, economic stability or just continuing with the status quo? Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, I think the way my, my aunt put it was so eloquent, this idea of, you know, we are on this island, we, we drink the water, we eat the rice that's grown in Taiwan, we, we know whatever, right? Like, um, we are materially, physically, you know, like, connected to this land. And because of that, um, we have a right to decide what happens to the future of this land. And you could talk about, uh, today, all over the world, indigenous people as well. You know, this idea of, um, you know, being, uh, they're, they're, they're the caretakers of, of this, the area, the land, they know it really well, right? And so, um, you know, I think that it, it really does just, it makes sense practically, but also, I mean, I think um, people have seen it also as a human rights issue too, right? That, you know, one one's ability to be able to um, have, uh, you know, um, sovereignty and control of the, the, the things, the means of your survival, of your living, and not only just the means of it, but the, the value in, of that. You know, the value of your, 
your existence and your connection to the land um, and being able to decide its destiny uh, rather than um, being controlled by other people and other interests that are not necessarily your own. Yeah, I think it's, it seems so obvious, right? But then on the other hand, it's uh, <laughs> for those who want to control territories, it's, it's not, you know. And there's so many ways to slowly get people to lead them astray <laughs> and have them decide that, uh, yeah, maybe this land is better if it's controlled by another, another group of people who don't live on the land, you know, not tied to it. This was the one that uh, particularly wow. really fascinated me. And, and one of the things uh, that particularly you expected me to say this was democratic grandmother. <laughs> um, and I was curious about um, how this nickname arrived and uh, when exactly did she first start getting interested in politics? Uh, because as, as you suggest, it was, uh, it was quite a dangerous thing to do, uh, particularly in the uh, latter period of, of martial law. Yeah, it's, it's actually um, her, her children. So um, it was my oldest um, uncle who passed away before my grandmother. Um, and his, his, the last words that he said before he died was independence, which is really dramatic. You know, it was very, he's at the hospital, you know. Of course, my grandmother, when my grandmother you know, she came out of the hospital, she was like, Tinsoy, you know. So, um, you know, they're, they're these sort of, they're icons and symbols, you know, what these desires, but, um, you know, so it was my uncle, and um, who was an activist, and then my, my aunties, and they would uh, tell her about things, and then she would go to the um, to these kind of uh, sort of secret uh, enclaves, like you know, in the alleys, and just listen to politicians uh, speak. And she was the oldest person there, it's always, you know, and so. So you were talking about the 1980s. She started to, or yeah. early uh -huh. 70s. Mm, gosh, I don't even know what year, but you know, she was also part of the Presbyterian Church, which is where a lot of activism um, was also happening. So she yes. was involved in that too. So that's why I have a shot of the church. If you, oh, does, does she ever get um, um, in trouble with the police? Well, I, not that I know of. Mm. Yeah, but she's well, you know, kind of camouflaged. Okay. As a nice elderly lady <laughs> <laughs> with a cane or an umbrella. Okay. That can do damage because I've seen her do that. <laughs> she would get on the bus and take her umbrella and hit people's legs. <laughs> so she goes, "Let me sit down." <laughs> I was so embarrassed. I turned pink. And I'm like, "Oh, you still turn pink?" Double G. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Just, she, you know, she's like, "Get up." <laughs> but it is quite interesting uh, for me because I'm not a big fan of always go for the politics. 
Yeah. What I noticed was the, uh, the beginning of the film, and uh, I can see why it's called 62 years and uh, six and a half thousand miles between, yeah. because the dif difference and the distance between you two, when she look at you, say, oh, you look, oh, look at you, what's wrong with you? You have to be so comfy. And that, that's just really reflecting the uh, difference between age and culture. For me, that's yeah, really interesting. Uh -huh. yeah. And you didn't really set out to really s pursue that route, actually. Sort of, that, that particular route sort of fade out a little bit for me. Yeah. Yeah. Is that I mean, true? Well, I think I wanted to really um, have people think about how difficult a task this was. Because within that 10 years, like, I, I, my mom told me that I needed to just stay away from my family in Taiwan. And it was this clash between, well, tradition and modernity, oh, okay. because they wanted me to get, actually, I think I was like 26, and they were like, oh, you're 30. And I'm like, no, I'm like 20, I've got four years, oh, you gotta get married, you're, oh, no, actually in Taiwan, you're 27, but that pretty much means that you're 28, and you're actually 30. And I'm like, no. So they were just like pressuring me, like, you gotta, live. and they set me up with all these guys, and I felt so bad, because I had to go to these, like, you know, meetings, yeah, exactly. And my grandmother would go with me, and my mother would go with me, and my aunt would go with me, and I just even like, your mom. Yeah, yeah, it was so embarrassing. <laughs> and they give me photos, like which one do you like? I'm like, oh come on. No, no. Anyway, so I mean that's just, that's a whole other movie, but I, you know, so it, yeah. But I, I wanted to set set that up as like how difficult this is going to be, oh. right? Yeah, it's really interesting. Thank you. I think we don't have more questions. Maybe later you can. Yeah. A private conversation with <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.